You doing good? If you got your Bibles, you can turn with me. We're going to go to Matthew uh, chapter 28. And um, today is uh, kind of a big deal. Uh, it's Easter Sunday uh, in church world. It's kind of like the Super Bowl of Sundays, okay? Uh, where we celebrate and honor the reality that God is not dead. No, he is very, very, very alive. Now, uh, this has been kind of like a, a bit of a, of, a, of a journey this weekend because on Friday night, we celebrated Good Friday. And so we went into great depth regarding the crucifixion of Christ. Um, and then today, we're gonna be celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Um, so I won't go into, a, a, into great depth on, on, uh, on his death uh, because we're gonna celebrate the fact that he is no longer dead, but he's very alive, okay? All right, so that's kind of, just in case you didn't know what we were going to be talking about today, and just in case you didn't know what we are going to be doing, that's kind of what today is all, all about, okay? Well, you know, okay, awesome. I'm glad we got that established. Now, it, it is kind of interesting. There's a, a, a story that Billy Graham used to tell, uh, a true story, where when he was a, a boy, his parents had a bit of an ant problem, okay? And so Billy's mom called the exterminator, to have the exterminator come to take care of these ants, to kill these ants. Well, Billy was kind of bummed out by this. He was really sad about this. So he felt like he needed to warn the ants, okay? And so he, uh, he went and found the fattest ant that he could find, thinking that if he found the big ant, that ant might have enough clout to go and warn the other ants, to get them out of there. Uh, before the exterminator killed him, okay? So anyways, Billy goes and finds like the fattest ant that he can find and he, and he picks it up and he, and he warns the ant. He says, you know, my mom and dad are about to kill all of you, right? So tell the others, warn the others, y you're all about to die, okay? Go, <laughs> go, run, hurry, hurry. Don't turn, don't look back, go, go. Anyways, uh, so... The exterminator came uh, towards the end of the week, and, uh, and Billy was really bummed out. And the reason why he was bummed out is because th there were still all these ants. In fact, there were more ants than, than ever. And so Billy went to his mom and said to his mom, Mom, I, I, I don't get it. I, I, tried to warn, I tried to warn the ants because I don't want them to die. And, and they didn't get the message. They didn't get the memo. There's more ants than, 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 than ever. And Billy's mom said, Billy, the only way that that could have worked, is you would actually have to become an ant. And then you would have to go into the ants and you'd have to speak to them in their ant language. And you'd have to warn them that they were all about to die. And then they would get the... Now, this is, this is the brilliant Billy Graham's mom. This is what she says. Now, Billy, would you be willing to leave the comforts of being a human... And the comforts of sleeping in your bed and having meals made for you. Would you be willing to leave all of these comforts in order to become an ant so that you could speak to them in their ant language and warn them in order to save them? And Billy said, no. No, I would not be willing to become an ant. And, um, of course, Billy Graham would use that as a, metaphor of our great God who so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to become flesh and to dwell among us in order to bring a message that we could understand. And isn't, isn't that brilliant? That's so, that's so Billy, that's so Billy Graham, right? Guys, we are celebrating this weekend the reality that our mighty God so loved and loves the earth. Every person and their sinfulness and their brokenness and all their stuff that our God so loved the world that he, that he instigated a rescue mission that was composed of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit and that all three together, they work together in this incredible, that the Father so loved the world that he sent his Son, that the Son so loved the Father and so loved the world that the Father loved that he went 
And the Spirit so loved the Father and the Son that the Spirit came and indwelt the Christ. And it's awesome to think that God still so loves the world that he has given the world his sons and daughters. Yeah. And that we so love the Father that we go. That we go and we tell this incredible good news that we call the gospel of the kingdom. Yeah? And the Spirit so loves the Father who so loves the Son who so loves us that the Spirit of God comes and indwells within us, comes and abides within us so that we can go and continue on this great mission of Christ Jesus. This is what we're celebrating this weekend, the fact that mighty God is alive and well and is at work on the earth through his glorious church. Yep, 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 yep. That's true. That's true. Every word of that just says true. All right. All right. Matthew, Matthew 28. So we know that um, Jesus came, he lived, he modeled kingdom, and then he died. After he died, they took his body and they placed it in a rich man's tomb, in a borrowed tomb, okay? Jesus literally had no possessions. He didn't even have his own, his own plot, okay? So they buried him. They were worried about a staged resurrection, okay? Word had gotten out that Jesus had predicted his death and had predicted his resurrection. And they were worried about a staged, a fake resurrection. And so they actually placed Roman guards at, at, at his tomb. They put a huge stone in front of his tomb to protect the body, to keep people away, and to keep his followers from faking his resurrection. Okay, Matthew 20. Now, after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first day, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. How would you like to be the other Mary? <laughs> Mary and the other Mary. Okay, all right, verse 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. This is so awesome. An angel comes from where? From heaven, and he comes and does what? He rolls back that huge stone, and then what does he do? He sits on it, and he's just like, yeah, uh, what? He moves the stone. He sits on the stone. What did he look like, Pastor Darren? I'll tell you. Thanks for asking. His appearance was like, Lightning. Okay? Are you seeing it? Good. That's because of the sound effects. All right. And his clothing was white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. And that means the Roman guards pretended to be dead so that Flash Angel wouldn't kill him. Okay? They're, they're like, they're on the ground. They're like, is he still there? Yes. <laughs> He, he doesn't look happy. Okay, uh, verse 5. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly, tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. That means he's no longer dead, okay? And behold, He's going before you to Galilee. There you'll see him. See, I have told you. So what did they do? They departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. And they ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them saying, greetings. All right, that's scary. Okay, awesome. And they came up and took his feet and they worshiped him. And Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers, go to Galilee, and there they will see me also. Okay, Luke 24, we're going to a different, a different book, a different gospel. I love it. Four different gospels, four different authors. They all capture this incredible story of the resurrection of the Christ. So Luke 24, verse 13. This is kind of like, you know, meanwhile, okay, meanwhile, different place, okay, different time, okay, there are these two people, and they are going to a village called Emmaus. And it's about seven miles from Jerusalem, verse 14. And while they're talking with each other about all these things that had happened, while they're talking, Jesus himself draws near to them. So Jesus, Jesus comes, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him, so they don't know it's Jesus. And he says to them, hey guys, what are you talking about? Okay. 
And, um, and, and they're, still, they're still talking, and they're looking sad. i got to come up with a better voice for Jesus because it's too creepy. we got to, like, more of like a Batman voice. Hey, guys. Okay. You know, what is this conversation that you're having with each other as you walk? And they, that's not much better. And they stood still, and they're, they're looking sad. And verse 18, one of them, named Cleopas, okay, answered him, are you the only visitor, <laughs> like he kind of rebukes this guy, he rebukes Jesus. Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know what's been taking place the last few days? And Jesus says, what things? <laughs> Jesus is like, there's been stuff going on? Please tell me more. Uh, and, and they, uh, c concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man, look at what they describe him as though. They, they call him a mighty prophet. So like, a man who is a mighty prophet indeed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. Um, but we had hoped, check it out, but we had hoped that he was actually going to be the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Wherever some women, okay, from our company, kind of freaked us out a bit. They, they came to the tomb early in the morning and they did not find his body, okay? They came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who claimed he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb. They found it just as the women had described, but they didn't see him. And he said to them, so Jesus speaks to them and you know, Jesus, you know, he's so pastoral, right? Like, you know, I did a message recently on how unchrist-like Christ was. <laughs> You know, because they're always like, you, you got to be more like Christ. you got to be nicer. Jesus, you know, wasn't very nice. I'm just saying. I'm nice. Jesus, not so nice. Okay, verse 25. Jesus responds to them. He goes, oh, you foolish fools. <laughs> you know, like, you know, good times. Slow of heart to believe all the prophets that have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and the prophets, Jesus tells them all the scriptures and how they relate to himself. How many of you, that's one heck of a sermon. Can you imagine hearing Jesus preach and going through the entire Bible, all the, all the Mosaic scriptures and revealing where he was at in all of that. And by the way, um, for those of you that want to be a, a preacher one day, or a, this is the role of every preacher is to reveal the Christ throughout the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation. The whole Bible is about Jesus. Amen. Okay? All right, good. So that's what Jesus did. And so they drew near to the village, which they were going, and he acted as if he was going to keep going. So Jesus, that, that's funny. Like Jesus pretended like he was going to keep going, but they stopped him and they said, no, 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 you stay with us because it's getting late. So Jesus stayed with them, verse 30. And when he was with them at the table, he, Jesus took the bread and then he blessed it and he broke it. Now, when Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it, immediately their eyes were open and they recognized him. But as soon as they recognized who it was, he vanished right in front of them. Poof, gone. Yeah, that's, that's cool, right? All right, he vanishes, and then they said to another, No, oh, did we not recognize? Was not our hearts burning within us as he opened the scriptures and he talked to us? And they got up that same hour, they returned to Jerusalem, and they found the 11, and those who were with them, they were gathering, and this is what they said. The Lord has risen indeed. Yeah. He is risen. Yeah. He is risen. Yeah. This is what they said. For reals. Yo, 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 no, 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 no. For real, for real, for real. He's alive. We saw him. We ate with him. Yep, that's what happened. All right. I get worked up and then I lose my spot. Um, what verse are we in? You're like, you said this was the Super Bowl. All right, it's all good. So then they were talking about these things. Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. But as they were startled and frightened, so look at now, Jesus is just appearing places. He's disappearing, then he's appearing. Frightened, they thought, of, they thought he was a spirit. So they're like, this isn't really Jesus. Jesus died and now his ghost is here. So this is what Jesus says. Why are you troubled and why, uh, uh, and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands, look at my feet and see that it is I myself. 
touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? You know, he's like, you know, me hungry, right? Like this has been a heck of a three days, like literally been to hell and back, okay? He's like, can you, can you get me some food? And so they, they cook up some fish for him and look at what he does. He takes the fish and he eats it in front of them. One of my favorite scriptures, you know, resurrected Jesus, resurrected body, eats, okay? What is that proof of? In heaven, there will be food. No, no, no. Like really good. Okay, all right. right. (laughs) Me hungry? No. Feed pastor. Verse 44. And then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets, okay, uh, must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to the understanding of the scriptures. So check it out. He reveals himself, and then he gives them a revelation of the gospel of salvation. And he begins to reveal this gospel of salvation to them. He reveals it to them. The law of Moses and the prophets must be fulfilled. Uh, understanding. And he says to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer on the third day, rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Beginning from Jerusalem. Okay? This is what he says. Um, uh, uh, Christ must suffer, and he would also rise. Therefore, the response to this revelation should be repentance. Everyone say repentance. Okay, what does repentance mean? Okay, basically the picture that we see is that um, if you are on your way uh, into a disaster, repentance is the moment of I should turn away from this disaster and turn into safety. So when he says that that the response to the revelation of what Christ has done, our response should be, okay, I have been on my way into a disaster, living a life of disaster, but because I know of what Jesus has done and because he has provided a way of escape, we are now empowered as a people to turn away from the disaster and to turn into Christ. Okay, this is what repentance means. Look at the person next to you and say, now would be a good day for you to repent. No, I'm just kidding. No, don't, don't do that. Okay, okay. For you, should we repent? Okay, verse 48. You are witnesses of these things. Behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but you stay in this city uh, until you are clothed with power from on high. He is risen. And that's where you say he is risen. And it's funny. When I first became a pastor, you guys, it was on... Uh, my first day of pastoring was Easter Sunday, okay, uh, 2009, which means uh, Easter Sunday today, 2020, uh, this is 13 years of pastoring. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, yeah. Statistically, I should be dead, but look at me. I look amazing. Okay, awesome. We're, we're having fun, aren't we? Okay, now. Here's what we're going to look at, you guys. Um, We're going to look at this place of where, yes, Jesus died, and the cross is the symbol of our great Christian faith. Yeah? Um, We also know that Jesus is alive, and that's what we're celebrating today. But for many of us, even though we know that literally Jesus resurrected, we live as though it is theoretical. So even though we know or we're being told today, I'm telling you that Jesus is alive, and you're like, okay, if you say so, you know, some of you guys... You drank the Kool-Aid, we're in this thing, okay? Others of you, you're like, eh, I don't really know where I'm at with, with this whole thing, okay? And, that's, and that, that's, that's totally fine. Let me just tell you this. Jesus lived, he died, he resurrected. And this is what I know, that people within their religious journey, a lot of people, even though we're told that Jesus is alive, when we live out our faith and when we see Christ, we still see him as the, res, the, the crucified Christ on a cross. So um, even though we did a good Friday service, which was awesome, the, the Friday service that we did this last, last it, was, it was so, so, so cool. So, this is what I know. Uh, some of you are in it, man. You are, you are in this place of resurrection life, and there is resurrection power at work in your mind, your will, your emotions, your family, your finances. It's resurrection life, and anything less than life, won't, you won't settle for it. 
and yet others of you are still in Friday. I call it Black Friday. Some of you guys are still in, in, in dark Black Friday, right? And uh, Some of you are, when, when you think of the, the, the Christ, he's still on the cross. And the reason why this matters is because we're in a room right now filled with individuals that represent destiny. We're in a room right now filled with all these storylines, all these movies in the spirit that are, that are playing. And this is what I know, that every single person here, at some point in your life, your heart was filled with hope. At some point in your life, you had some sort of dream. At some point in your life, maybe it was just when you were a kid, or maybe it was when you, you thought you were going to go to college. Oh my gosh, I'm going to college. I'm going to meet a marine biologist. I'm going to save dolphins. I'm going to change the world. Right? So I don't know if, 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 if you were filled with that hope and dream as a child and then you lost it before college, or maybe you went to college and, and you were like, I hate dolphins, I hate salt water, I want nothing to do with sea anemones. Ah, I'm done. I just want a job. Now I work at Xfinity, right? So anyways, <laughs> that was my story. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> The point, the point is this. God creates us from his heart with destiny, with purpose. And all of a sudden we quickly realize that we're born into a fractured system. And we realize that it really is true. Paul said it right when he said that through one man, sin entered the world. Paul said that through one man, through the first Adam, came a fracturedness and a brokenness everywhere. This is what we all have in common. All of us have been born into a fractured spiritual economy. All of us have been born into a system of separation. But as King Solomon would say, all of us have been born with the record of eternity in our spirits. Meaning this, that our spirit testifies that we were made for the garden. Our spirit testifies that we were made for long walks with our creator. And yet we're born into a system where we feel separated from our real father. So a lot of us, we go through our life trying to figure out how to be loved so that we can love. Or a lot of us figure out how to be just religious enough so that God will put up with us. Many people are trying to figure out how can they be good enough? How can they fill up their good bucket so that when they get to heaven, God will have to let them in because they did so many good things, hoping that their good things would outweigh the bad things. I've had so many conversations with people, like I've, I've had these conversations with people like, like, hey, if you were to die right now, do you know for sure that you would go to be with heaven? And I've had people tell me before, I think so and I hope so. And I say, why? And they say, because I've done, I do a lot of good things, and I'm not as screwed up as my neighbor. So it's like, the, it's, it's salvation through comparison. Anyone ever been there? I hope I'm going to be okay. Why? Because I'm not as screwed up as that guy. Yeah. But I've also talked with other people. In fact, I, I talked with a gal here in Newcastle. She was a paralegal. And I asked her, in, in front of her boyfriend, I said, if you were to die right here, right now, do you know for sure that you would go to heaven? You know what she said? She goes, I know for a fact that I wouldn't go to heaven. I was so blown away by her honesty. I was like, wow, you're definitely not a Christian. I said, um, she goes, I know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't mean that. I, I, said, uh, <laughs> I said, wow, thank you for your, I said, why do you say it? She goes, because I am not a good person. Yeah. And so when we look at this, Dream, desire, but all this fracturedness, all this striving, all this attempting to try to be good, to try to prove ourselves uh, within the world. But then what happens? Smash. 
I thought she was the one. She, she was beautiful and this, that, and the other, and she left me now. She doesn't want to be with me, and, 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 and I knew that was going to happen. That happened to my dad, and I knew it's just a matter of time before another woman rejects me. Or, or I thought it was the perfect job. It seemed like the perfect job. I, I, my, I, they said that they were going to make me vice president. They said that I was going to be the next CFO. Uh, like, yeah, everything. All of a sudden, I'm fired now. I have no job now. I can't find a job. The economy is crazy. Ah, I knew it was going to be that. It was just the matter of time before corporate America screws me over like you know and like and, and, and this 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 is every single person in this room we've got a similar story where it was like yes yes here we go here we go slip and smack and we find ourselves on our face and then we realize how naive were we how naive were we to actually think that we were going to be set apart from everybody else? How naive were we to actually think that we were going to change the world? And then what do we do? We figure out the performance that life is going to be. And we figure out what our performance is going to look like. Maybe it's going to be a Christian performance. What is a, what is, tell me, what does a Christian do? Well, a Christian goes to Sarah Vile Center, okay? It <laughs> Go, uh, goes to the 9 a.m. Christ, the Christians don't go to the 11. All the real Christians go to the 9 a.m., the early one, you know. Uh, they're the heart, you know, the 11, or they're the seekers, you know. <laughs> you know. Uh, you know. Okay, so check, all right? And what else does a Christian do? Well, you know, a Christian, a Christian doesn't um, uh, uh, smoke cigarettes. Okay, you, you can vape occasionally, all right? And, and, you know, like, so oh, I'm going to quit smoking cigarettes, all right? You know, uh, a Christian, you know, and, and we, we figure out, and we begin to figure out what our Christian performance is going to be. Or, or you're like, man, forget Christianity. I'll never vote Republican. You're just like... Um, you know, so I'm going to be a non-Christian, and, and I'm not going to believe in any religion. I'm not going to believe in any God. And here's what my performance life is going to look like. I'm going to crush it at my job, and that means I'm going to have to crush relationships because I can't trust people. It's all about my career and riches, you know, and this whole thing. And we go into this performance thing where um, we've got uh, hope that's deferred. We, we've, we've got disappointment that we don't even want to think about anymore because we got lied to. We got tricked. We, we were told that, that we could all be uh, superstars. We, were, we could all be astronauts. We could all do whatever we wanted. We got lied to. And we, and we got, we got set, set this whole thing, whole thing up. And what we find is that in life, we're surrounded by people that are just going one more day. Just one more day. And the problem is, is that within the church... People say, this is the way it ought to be because of the crucified Christ. So I'm, I'm going to expect rejection today. Why? Because they rejected Christ. I'm going to expect for this church to reject me just like the last church rejected me. Why? Because they rejected Jesus. I'm going to expect people to persecute me and treat me unjustly. and kind. Why? Because that's how they, that's how they treated Jesus. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expect the worst life ever. In fact, the harder my life is, the holier I will become. How many of you have ever met that person? The harder my life is, the, the more agony, the more, <laughs> the more negative my face looks, the more holy I am inside. And we and we go through and we go we go through we go through this place and and, and and this is this is this is what I got out of it. This is why I showered today. This is why I came here today. Okay, I came here to tell you this. Yes, Jesus was rejected. Yes, you were rejected. Yes, everybody thought that Jesus' mission and dream and, and had been subverted. Even his own uh, disciples thought. Well, he he said one thing, but he lied. He's dead. False prophet. Um, that, that yes, all, all, the, all of these things actually happened to the Christ, but that wasn't the end of the story. And so even though it looked like defeat for Jesus, and even though it looks like defeat for you, or it looked like defeat for you, and even though everybody thought that's, that's it's game over, that's the end of the story, and they all lived unhappily ever after. We are here today on Easter Sunday to say that the cross was not the end of the story. The cross was the beginning of the story. His rejection was not the end. His rejection was the genesis. It was the beginning. And you've got a choice to make. Are you going to frame out the rest of your life based off of something that seemed like defeat when that wasn't the end? It was the portal into a brand new beginning. And are you willing to have the courage to believe 
that yes, Jesus died, but he is not dead. Because if you're going to believe that Jesus resurrected and in doing so overcame sin, sickness, disease, and death, not just for himself, but for all of humanity, then we will have to believe the truth that death no longer has a hold over us. We will have to believe the truth that says this, that even though I walk in the shadow of death, that's as close to death as I will ever get. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you'll never die. So, uh, Pastor Darren, that seems somewhat hypocritical. Your dad died in 2016. Okay. My dad, where, where did he die? He died in Ukraine. That's interesting. I'm packing, I'm getting ready for the trip to Ukraine. I go to get on my Facebook because I got distracted. And when I got on my Facebook, I looked and I wasn't logged on as myself. I was logged on as my dad. That's never happened before. I don't even know his password. So I'm like, hey, I'm here. So I might as well watch some of his videos and watch some of his preaching videos. So I'm sitting there and I'm watching a bunch of his videos and I'm re re reliving some of these experiences of his. Hmm, that's weird. The day before I leave, my dad's pastor calls me from Houston, Texas, Tony Kershack. I haven't talked to him since 2016. He says, Darren, how are you doing? I said, doing great. What's up, Tony? He said, we just found your dad's Bible. Guys, he died in 2016. It's 2022. He goes, we just found your dad's Bible. And he goes, and it was given to your dad from your grandparents. It's signed by your grandma and your grandpa. And it's got all of his notes and it's got things underlined. Would you like, I said, Tony, this is crazy, man. I was like, my dad's been coming up recently. And uh, it's crazy. You're, you're calling me the day before I leave for Ukraine, which is where, which is where, my, where my dad died. And so we go and, and, uh, and last Sunday we were uh, in Ukraine. We went and worshiped with a bunch of wild people that were refusing to leave their country. They were believing that God's going to restore their country. So we worshiped with Ukrainians that, 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 that weren't going to leave, okay? Even though many people in that church, you know, did leave. So we were there with, like, this remnant, right? The pastor, I, I've never met him before, okay? And, and he, was, he was given my information from another pastor. This is Pastor Darren, et cetera, et cetera. I introduced myself on Pastor Darren. He goes to introduce me, and he says, we'd like to welcome to our pulpit today Pastor Daryl. He introduces me with my father's name. He had never met my dad. There was no, you say, what's, what's going on? What's going on is this. Death has been overcome. We walk in the shadow of death. If you believe in me, you will never die. Paul says, what are you going to do, kill me? <laughs> I've already died. It is no longer I who live, but he who we celebrate today this great reality that rejection and decay do not define us. Therefore, our expectation is not to be rejected, shut down, and to live in poverty, thinking that that is some sort of appearance of holiness. No, he is risen. We is risen. He was not just crucified for you. He was crucified as you. That on the cross, he became your sin. He became your poverty. He became your shame. He became your abandonment. He became your addiction. That he who knew no sin became all of our sin so that we could immediately, instantaneously be the righteousness of Christ Jesus. Paul would say that like this. He was like, your, your, your brain hasn't caught up yet. Therefore, your, tra your practical transformation will occur through the renewing of your mind, it's going to take time for your brain to catch up to what you are in the spirit. And this is what the Lord is saying to Seattle Revival Center. We are going to have to start thinking life thoughts and not death thoughts. 
we are going to have to expect success and not expect failure. We're going to have to expect to be healthy and holy and not expect to be sickly and depraved. We are going to have to expect revival and harvest and not expect just ongoing traditional religious games. We're going to have to expect the fire of God and the glory of God. We're going to have to expect uh, resurrection miracles. Why? Because resurrection power is seated within you. You're going to have to expect that God is going to use you because by golly, he created you. You're going to have to expect that you are still alive for such a time as this. That it's not time to be wrapping something up. It's time to start building something up and you're going to have to wake up to the fact that you can go back to the cross and you will not be there and you can go to the empty tomb and he will not be there. They were expecting a body in a tomb. They were disappointed to find out that he wasn't there. But that disappointment got dealt with when the angel said, no, this disappearance is a good thing. He's alive and you're going to see him. Listen, no more death thoughts. No more death wishes. No more religious programming. No more performance. No more trying to figure out what does a Christian do? What does a Christian act like? What does a Christian sound like? No, it is time to wake up to this fact that union has been made available. Trust me on this one. You do not need a religion. You need an experience with your creator. You do not need just another philosophy. You do not need just another rule book. You need an encounter with the life. You don't need to get a life. You need to find him, the life. He is the way, the truth, the life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm telling you, Seattle Revival Center will make a lousy salvation center. We do not want to save you. Pastor Darren does not want to save you. I was just having a conversation with Roy before this service started. He asked me a question. He said, um, how, how, how involved do you allow yourself to be with people in the church when they're really struggling with, with something and they, they need help? Like, how involved do you allow yourself to be? And I, I said to him, when I first started pastoring, I would get really, really involved in people's lives. Like, more involved than what people wanted. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like, you get, my first couple years of, of pastoring, I was calling the cops all the time. Like the police, I was getting people arrested. I was meeting, I, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. I, I just had this heart for justice. I just had this heart for things to be made right. I would be like screaming at people like, why don't you see it? This is not healthy. Like I'd be pleading with people. Like, you know, I was very, now, you, you know what I learned? Is that to the degree I was able to save somebody the first time, Usually there was a second time. And if I had to be their savior the first time, I'd have to be their savior the second time. And I had to quickly realize that if I was going to have any sort of sustainability within ministry, I was going to have to see that only Jesus can be people's savior. And I, I am not allowed to posture myself in the life of somebody else where they build a codependent relationship off of me to the degree that if I'm not available to them, they're going to backslide because I was their Jesus. You do not need Darren as your shepherd. You need Jesus as your shepherd. And if he is your shepherd, you shall not want. And he wants to be your shepherd. He wants to be your helper. He wants to be your source. He wants to be your vine. Are you willing to transition from death, decay, abandonment, hope deferred, all the places within your past? Are you willing to transition with him? You shared in the sufferings of Christ. Are you willing to step into the glory of Christ? That's the invitation available today on Easter Resurrection Sunday. The moment, listen, where you have to have the courage to walk out of the tomb. Let's stand.
Can we pray? Jesus, would you come right now? And would you do what only you can do? And that is come face to face with each and every person in this room. Heart to heart with each and every person in this room. You know the storylines. You know the abandonment. You know the betrayal. You know the lies that we have believed, the expectations that things are going to go wrong, that our heart is going to be broken, that we're not worth fighting for, that we're not, it's not even worth speaking up about. Jesus, would you come face to face with each and every person here? so that they could see how valuable they are. So that they could know that if they were the only one, that you would have died just for them. That we are worth living for, that we were worth dying for, that we were worth it. That you didn't just die for us corporately. You died for us individually. That you knit us together in our mother's womb. That you died for us on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. And yet you also resurrected from death for us. So that we could also step over from death thoughts into life thoughts, from death choices into life choices, from words of death into words of life. Instead of framing brokenness over ourselves and our spouse and our children, we could frame life over ourselves and, and over our children and over our spouse. Lord, we choose this day to trade out death for life. And we choose this day, even for those of us that have made a bit of a home inside the tomb. We declare this day, April 17th, 2022, as the last day we will ever see the inside of this tomb. It's scary. There's a lot of things that are unknown, but we choose to step out of the tomb with you right now with every head bowed, every eye closed, every heart open, would you see yourself taking the hand of Jesus? And would you see him as he leads you out of the tomb? And Paul would say that we are actually seated with Jesus in heavenly places. What does that mean? It means that he brings us out of the tomb and then he takes us up. He takes us up where we can be with him in heavenly places. Are you willing to go up? Would you be willing for your thoughts to come from above? That we would live on earth while being seated in heaven. I'm going to lead us uh, through a prayer of repentance and a declaration of salvation. And I'd like for us all to do it together because I think probably every person in this room, there's things that we could turn away from and turn into Christ. I think there's probably areas where we could, where we could repent. Thoughts of uh, unhealthy thoughts of disaster that we've been heading towards and things that we've been saying that haven't been right that we can turn away from today that we could, areas of our heart where we've been heading into the direction of death, that we can turn away from today to turn into the life of Christ. So I'll lead us through a prayer, and we can all pray this together. For some of you, this will be the very first time declaring that you believe in your heart and confessing with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord. And as we pray together, the Holy Spirit's going to come like a dove, 
He's going to rest upon you. A fresh peace, a fresh joy is going to come upon you. And also, also with that, the death sentence associated with the curse of sin is going to be broken once and for all. In Jesus' name. Let's pray. Jesus, we believe in our hearts and we confess with our mouth that you are God, that you are good. We confess we have sinned against you. We turn away from the patterns of sin. We turn away from even the record of our ancestors' transgressions. And we ask that your blood would cover us. And we give thanks in knowing you have written our names in the Lamb's book of life. We declare we are a new creation. We're no longer outsiders. We are insiders. And now we ask for your fire to come on everything that is associated with death. We invite the fire of God on death thoughts, death wishes. We invite your fire on curses that have been spoken against us. We invite your fire. Come right now. Burn it, burn it, burn it, burn it, burn it, burn it. Expectation of rejection. We invite your fire to come on that spirit of rejection right now in Jesus' name. And will you just declare with me right now and just say, I am loved. I am lovely. And this is possible because of you, Jesus. And everybody in agreement said, Woo! Is that good? Hey, listen, that's, that's Jesus. And when you leave here, he's going to leave with you. This isn't just an emotion. This is a person. I want to welcome you into the family of God. You are now part of the fastest growing family on the face of the earth. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Listen now, you alive. So live like you're alive. Yeah? All right. God bless you.